I've been talking to a lot of people lately uh, and they've got this sticking point in their development where they're like asking themselves who am I to do that? Who am I to do that? Um, and I remember when I was younger when I you know, first had these aspirations to live a full life to experience the things I wanted to experience to you know to live on that dangerous edge if you want that, 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 that exciting edge I had the same feeling it was kind of for me it was a working class chip it was that feeling of uh, well who are you who am I who are you to do that there, there was in my mind there was a definite us and them you know some people could achieve and some people couldn't uh, there was an us and there was, there was a them and I was definitely <laughs> I was definitely an us um, so every time I thought about doing something this voice in my head would go well who the fuck are you who are you to do that you're not anybody and that would be mirrored by the people around me if I said oh, I'm going to write a book it'd be like funny faces and well who are you you know what well, who are you to do that um, and I remember uh, even when I was starting to get heavily into my karate you know, I studied karate for 40 years. I remember starting to get into it and really start to practice. I was starting to practice twice a day, even though I was working. And I remember practicing in my garden once. This is when I was married the first time around. And I was doing my kata and I was feeling strong. It's, I felt like it was coming. Um, and I come in and my wife said to me, do you realize what a cunt you look like out there? F forgive my language. I just want to keep it verbatim and show you how that kind of language and that kind of um, directness from somebody I loved went straight through. It went straight through and stuck on the cognition, on the, on the perception. And it mirrored everything I felt about myself. Yeah, well, who am I? Who are you to do that? You're not anybody. I remember growing up. I remember, I remember going on holiday, coming back when I was a kid and saying to my friends, I met this girl and she was beautiful and, and uh, you know, she was really nice. And one of my friends said, well, she, she, you wouldn't have got her because you're nothing. And I said, oh, yeah, I know I'm nothing. I know that. I know that. Of course. It wasn't true, but it's, he mirrored what was in me, what I felt. Um, and incidents in your life, you know, what, our, what they call the genetic curse. We're born with certain perceptions and we develop certain perceptions and cognitions in the first, I don't know, five, six years of our life, according to Freudian psychology, our internal parent, the superego. So we develop these beliefs and we're born with some of these beliefs. You know, these beliefs are put into us when we're in the womb. You know, they're fed into us, what our parent, what our... Um, you know, what our mother eats, what she drinks, what she watches, what she ingests, what she hears, what she believes. Of course, that's going to be part of us because we're part of her. So we're born with this um, genetic inheritance, which can be a gift or it can be a curse. That's the choice. We can do something with it. Even if it's a curse, we can do something with it. So I grew up with that feeling of who am I to do this? Um, but who are you not to do it? Who are you not to do it? One of the good things about my own life is that I have broken through that belief that I'm not good enough, that it's not for the likes of you. Um, there's a great book called The Ragged Trousered Philanthropist, which is about the birth of socialism. And he talks a lot in there about, you know, uh, the working man. Who are you to do this? You're not anybody. There's a dozen of them. That's just pure belief. It's a pure belief. It's a, you know, and it's a belief we need to challenge. The good thing for me is I've gone out and broke that and I've gone and done things that I didn't think were possible for me. You know, I've spent, you know, I was teaching in martial arts for 30 years and uh, traveled the world teaching martial arts, wrote books, you know, made films, won a BAFTA, you know, uh, was at all of these posh awards and been to all these nice places and I live a free life. Um, so I've been sat in places, I don't know if I ever told the story, but um, when I was at the BAFTAs, I was in the toilets, and when I was washing my hands, I noticed uh, another guy there, a big black guy, uh, looked a bit nervous, he was uh, breathing quite heavy, <sighs> this kind of thing, and I said, oh, you look a bit nervous, I said, are you up for an award? And he goes, uh, no, I'm actually presenting one, and we got talking, he was wearing a nice watch, he got a nice... Um, diamond encrusted Rolex or something and I said I like your watch very nice and I'd got a Panerai I think and he said oh, I like your watch uh, we danced <laughs> we, you know so we got we had a mutual appreciation of watches we got talking and, and in the end he put his hand out he said I'm LL Cool J and I said oh I'm Jeff I didn't know who he was 
But what I liked about it was the fact that he was just a normal kid from a, from a kind of difficult background, suddenly finds himself presenting an award at the BAFTAs and he doesn't know how he got there um, but he's broke through those barriers of I don't you know who am I to do this he was a normal bloke just a normal kid I spent half an hour talking to Anthony Mangala when I was there again exactly the same he's grew up he, his dad was an ice cream salesman and became one of the greatest filmmakers of his generation the nicest guy you know I'm, I'm surrounded by people who have broken through that barrier of who am I um, you know, my friend Jim Cartwright comes from real working class stock, but you know, he's broke through that. He's broke through that and he's one of the, you know, one of the greatest playwrights of the last century. So this idea that, you know, I'm not good enough or, you know, who am I? It's, it is a belief we have to question when it rises up. It's, we have to question it. We have to observe it without identification. We have to challenge it. We, ask, we have to ask, where's the proof? You're saying I'm not good enough. Where's the proof? It's not true. It's not true. I've got this, this body, it's got 150 billion cells and those cells, each of them a microcosm of me, um, are attached to everything else in this universe. And if I'm able to control this body, if I'm able to align this body and get some sovereignty over it, I've got the same potential as anybody else. You know, maybe my karma's different, maybe my perceptions and beliefs are different, but they can be changed. Even genetic perceptions can be challenged and changed. They can, it's definite. I'm, I'm the proof, I'm the living proof, and I'm around a lot of people who are the living proof. So the key is not to think, um, the, the key is, is not to engage and identify with the belief of who am I, but the, the key is to look at it and dismiss it, and look at it and just say, that's, I'm not even going to have that, I'm not going to believe that. I don't, I, don't, I don't trust that. If you want to do something, if you want to achieve something, there isn't a force on this earth that can stop you. Everything is possible. It's not probable, but it's possible. When I go and do talks for people, that's basically what I say. I'm here to tell you it's possible. It isn't probable because most people won't do the work. Most people won't challenge old beliefs. Most people are afraid to challenge old beliefs. Most people are afraid to do the work to challenge their perceptions, to change their cognitions. Most people won't, you know, change the oil in their car every two weeks or every three weeks. Most people won't change their socks once a day. Most people haven't got, you know, enough control over their own physical body to even keep it healthy or even to know what that is. So it's possible, but it's not probable, but it's possible. So it's just about us doing the work. If we, ha if we are in, if we are in um, possession of this power plant, this amazing piece of machinery, this energy producing and this energy converting mechanism, we just need that to learn how to work it properly. And these days with the collective mind, you know, like the internet, you can find information. You can find instruction. I mean, information on its own isn't enough. And instruction on its own isn't enough. We have to experience it. Because knowledge is food, of course. Knowledge is food. It, in, it's, it's food in the same way as when you eat a steak, it's food. And fine knowledge um, can be transformative if you have the belief that it's, if you have the proof that it's true. So it's not enough to listen to someone like me or to read a book. It's about taking that information and proving it to yourself. Once you've experienced the truth, the truth is the truth. It's no longer uh, subjective. It's objective. It's objective to you. Like for instance, it was not possible for me to become a published author, I believed. It wasn't possible for me to become a black belt. I used to look up the line of, when I was a yellow belt, I used to look up the line of people in my class and look at the brown belts and think, God, you know, what would it be like to be a brown belt? That would be amazing. But, you know, being a black belt or a second dan or, or you know, a senior, real kind of high level senior martial artist, it was in, seemed impossible to me. These guys that were teaching us seemed impossibly good. But of course you climb the ranks and you get there and once you get your black belt nobody can tell you it's not possible because you've done it and when you um, publish your first book no one can tell you it's not possible it becomes an objective truth to you so there is no other than them there's a popular belief that there is another than them and if you want to believe that then it'll become your truth it's you that gives it the truth it's you that gives it reality but for me it's just another cop-out it's another excuse it's another um, uh, it's another soft excuse for not living the life you want to live. 
I am surrounded by people that have broken through all of these boundaries, living incredible lives, living incredibly rich lives and challenging the, the possible all the time. And when that feeling comes up that they're not worth it, they, they will either dismiss it and dissolve it or they will convert it into physical action and create a product or create a service or create a business or create a life from it. So this whole idea, again, the great thing about being at somewhere like the BAFTAs or um, being in the senior end of martial arts um, and, and being in the senior end of business, you know, working with some, a mentor, some of the top business leaders in the world, uh, you just see that everybody's ordinary, everybody. There is no us in them and everybody is extraordinary if they choose to act on their extraordinariness. Um, so when I'm with people, I, I look at them and I just, they're the same as me, they've got the same potential as me. When I first started to succeed and to achieve things in my life and break through these boundaries, even kids I went to school with would say to me, oh yeah, but you're different, but, but I'm not different. Or they would say to me, yeah, but you're special. I go, nah, you know, that'd be nice to believe that, but it's not true. It's not true. You know, people would say, but you know, but when they said you're different or when you're special, what they're really saying is, if I can make you special and make you different, I can place you at a distance from myself and say, he's doing it because he's special. He's doing it because he's different. He's doing it because he's gifted. Um, and that, and that um, excuses them from trying. I'm not doing it because I'm better or special or because I'm different or because I'm a prophet or because I'm a guru. I'm doing it because I'm curious. I'm doing it because I believe it's possible and I don't want to believe that it's not possible. So I prove it to myself. When I was working in factories at 32 sweeping floors, believe me, people didn't think I was special or different or, you know, extraordinary. I was a guy sweeping their, around their machine. I was a guy working in nightclubs you know, I was a guy, um, or a guy working on building sites. You know, people didn't look at me and go, "Yeah, he's he's different." You know, when Beckett Beckett tipped Beckett Beckett was one of the greatest writers of his generation. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Um, everybody talks about Beckett like he's a god, but when Beckett was fifty-nine, no fucking knew him. Hardly anyone knew him. It was only when he was 60 and he did Godot that it tipped and within a very short period of time he's got the Nobel Prize. You know, he didn't really do anything until his later years or he wasn't recognised. The work he did was always there, it just wasn't recognised. I read about a woman the other day. Um, she's just published a book at, she's 50 and they're calling her the new Kafka. Um, but before she got published, people just said the stuff was made no sense. It just didn't work. It was, um, you know, it was uh, not literary. Lot, like, you know, people didn't recognise. She, she wasn't recognised as the new Kafka. Now she, now she's being lauded around the world, and you know, people are, um, are bringing her to do talks and to do readings. Suddenly, she's very special. And suddenly, if you would put your name against hers, they would go. You, they would call you pretentious. If you said, um, "I've got the same potential as Beckett. I see myself as a new Beckett." Um, people would be very offended by that because that's a name that you can't challenge. It's just rubbish. It's absolutely rubbish. Where do you think Beckett got it from? Beckett got it from the same places we get everything else from. And he prepared his life so he could do that. The point is that, you know, before he was known, you know, if he said, I'm going to do something extraordinary, people would just go, well, who are you? Or, you know, before this woman became the new Kafka, people were just saying, well, people literally were saying, yeah, it's interesting, but who are you? You know, and if she said, I'm going to be this and that, people would have challenged that and called her pretentious. So everybody's got the potential. You've got to do the work, of course. We've got to sit down. We've got to break these barriers. We've got to challenge these fears when they come up, these old beliefs. We can't sit, wet, sit around, you know, there's an old saying that um, God feeds the birds but he doesn't put the food in their nest. You know, we, we've still got to go out and do the work. We've still got to go out and collect the nectar. But there is no us and them. And you have every, every, you have a, every chance to be successful in whatever area you want, the same as anybody else, if you're prepared to do the work.